Well, good morning, uh, everybody. Let's get going. Um, delighted to see so many of you here uh, to discuss a critical area about governing global growth, the new context. Governing global growth, the new context, governing, that emphasis there. That's going to be uh, very much underpinning uh, the remarks over the next hour from our three panelists. And I'd like you to be involved uh, right from the beginning, so I'm going to come to you early on in the discussion. Uh, we have Gordon Brown, uh, until last year the British Prime Minister, now still very active uh, internationally, Member of Parliament still. Uh, we also have Tijan Tiam, who is uh, Group Chief Executive of Prudential, and uh, Giorgio, who is now a uh, visiting scholar at the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy, but uh, until earlier this year, the Foreign Minister of Singapore since 2004. Welcome to you all. I just want to uh, underpin the kind of context in which we're discussing this this morning with the kind of remarks that we've been hearing hearing literally in the last few hours, like from Christine Lagarde, um, the managing director of the IMF, policy indecision and political dysfunction, her language from Washington, the vicious cycle is gaining momentum and frankly it's been exacerbated by this policy indecision and political dysfunction in uh, the global economic and financial environment. We've had what's happened at uh, UBS with one trader uh, who has been arrested over uh, two billion uh, which was misappropriated inside a bank which had been struggling to deal with up to 50 billion uh, which has uh, not been fully accounted for. So the kind of problems we saw from three years ago are still with us. I remind you what Robert Zellick said, President of the World Bank, that we're moving now from a moment of drama to a moment of trauma. And what Tim Geithner said uh, last weekend, uh, writing in the Financial Times, the question is not whether we, uh, is not um, uh, how the economic or financial capability to act is there to strengthen, but whether we have the political ability to do the right thing. Doing the right thing. Gordon Brown, I'd like a few, literally four to five minutes maximum from you, your reflections at this moment, and then I'm going to open it up when all three of you have spoken to hear from the floor too. Well, well first of all, can I say what a, what, a, what a privilege it is to be in Dalian and to be with uh, Professor Schwab, who is the inspiration for what's been achieved by the World Economic uh, Forum and to be able to talk to you about what I think is a, a critical turning point for the world economy over these next uh, few, few months. I, in uh, 2009, when we faced a banking crisis, uh, we called together the G20 and we agreed a plan to do three things. The first was to prevent a depression uh, and by the action we took, uh, we succeeded in preventing the recession becoming a depression. But the two other uh, agreements we had have not been fulfilled. Uh, the first was to rebuild the global financial system uh, around uh, global standards uh, and as you see we are, we are descending into national solutions to these problems, not global solutions. And the third was to have a global growth uh, agreement whereby the combined efforts of Asia, Europe, America and other continents could lift the world economy up uh, and give us a sustained period of uh, growth out of recession. And, and that never happened. The battle over exchange rates, a failure to reach an agreement on uh, surplus and deficits in South Korea, uh, the descent of the process into uh, bickering really about uh, currencies meant that we have no global growth agreement and that is what is desperately needed at the moment uh, for confidence to be restored. Uh, the euro area problem is now moving to the centre. Uh, the euro cannot survive in its present form. It's going to have to be reformed uh, dramatically. Uh, we are, I think, an hour to midnight in the way that we uh, uh, look at this issue in the euro area. But to understand the, the euro problem, uh, remember we in Britain had to make a decision about whether to join the euro. We did not join the euro for very good reasons that I'll explain in a minute. The, there are three problems in the European area, not just one. If you look at the accounts that you tend to, to, to find, around the world. People think of it as a fiscal problem or a debt problem. Uh, it is actually initially a banking problem and it is still a banking problem and it has never been solved when it has been a banking problem and the British, uh, sorry, the European banks uh, as a whole are grossly undercapitalized. They have liabilities far in excess of the American uh, banks. Individual countries' banks are over leveraged uh, 
uh, far in excess of what to, is allowed in other parts of the, of the world. And we've never properly recapitalized the banks. And we've now got the interplay between banks that are not properly capitalized and sovereign debt problems that have arisen partly because we've socialized or accepted responsibility for the bank's uh, li liabilities. You cannot begin to solve the European problem unless you understand it's a banking problem, it's a growth problem, the inability of the European economy to grow out of recession, as well as being a fiscal problem. And you will have to take coordinated action in all three areas to be able to achieve a solution to that problem. And I believe that the only long-term way that we can actually deal with the failure to grow in Europe, but also the fiscal and the banking problems we have, is that Europe it looks outwards as well as looks inwards. That Europe sees itself as part of a global economy trading with the rest of the world. That instead of only 7%, only 7% of Europe's exports going to China, India, Brazil, all the BRIC countries put together, it actually thinks globally about how it can export to the rest of the world for the future. And therefore it is important, I think, that Europe is part of the global growth pact that I'm talking about that Europe can export, America can start to export again, China increases its consumption, India opens up its uh, markets. We have a global agreement that these things will happen that will increase the growth of the world economy and then the confidence that will flow from China knowing it has an export market to America knowing it too can trade with the rest of the world and people can have more confidence in consumption at home. The spin-off effects from that and the multiplier effect uh, means that the world could actually have sustainable growth over the next few years. But unless there is global coordination, and part of that is dealing with the European problem, I foresee 10 years of low growth in Europe and America. I foresee very high levels of unemployment, uh, and I foresee a failure of coordination that will lead in the end to greater protectionism. And let us recall that that was the problem that locked the world into 10 years of low growth and in some cases negative growth in the 1930s and remained uh, unresolved all these, all these years. We've got to think globally as we answer this problem. Mr. Brown, can I just press you before I, I go to George and, and to Jan? <coughs> Policy indecision and political dysfunction. This is about leadership. And yeah. that's what even Tim Geithner was writing in the Financial Times but last week. But it's exactly week. the problem of the 1930s. Look, in, in the 1930s, Keynes, uh, as is now recognized, ha had proposals in the 1930s. He put them to the British government of the day uh, in a famous document. And on it, the head of the uh, Treasury wrote, inflation, extravagance, bankruptcy. Now, what are other people saying than that the European problem is one of extravagance with the threat of bankruptcy, with the looming threat of inflation if you don't deal with it? That is not the problem we face. The problem we face is a banking problem that is unresolved, a growth, a failure to be able to get growth, and we've got to find ways of doing that. And so, yes, there is a failure of political leadership, but there's no point. I would say you should have a G20 summit at the United Nations in advance of the France summit and I've said that for some months now, that they should have an early G20 summit. But you've got to have an agenda. You've got to know what you want to do. And you've got to have proposals. And it's when you have the proposals, as we did in 2009, to deal with the crisis that you get action. There's no point in people meeting for the sake of meeting. They've got to meet with an agenda for action. And I'm waiting to see that agenda being set out by the leaders that you're talking about. Giorgio, policy indecision, political dysfunction, the springboard for your remarks. The, the tectonic shift is the global power structure. From an American dominated world to what is increasingly a multipolar world. We're all used to the old cathedral, which was really founded on the American plate. And now the plates are cracking, shifting. But the yearning is to show up, restore the old cathedral. My fear is this may be unrealistic. And the problem of leadership really reflects the change in the power structure. When we heard Premier Wen Jiapao two days ago, China is not prepared to lead the world. China is prepared to be helpful. It doesn't want to be led either. The reality is, on different plates now, 
different operating systems must find their own internal balances. The Chinese, the European, the Americans, the others. Each must find its own balance between rights, responsibilities, which is really a problem of domestic politics. And somehow, you got to link them together so that we keep this one world and there are many problems we cannot each solve on its own. So we need greater coordination. It has to be built on greater respect, but it also must acknowledge that the operating systems are different in their deep internal construction. China will always operate a different internal system from America or from Europe. So I, I fear that there's too much hope invested in the idea that somehow we can rebuild that cathedral. I don't think it's possible. Better we have smaller structures, each internally stable, each with its own sense of responsibility, but require that we open, open our homes to one another. Like a TCPIP arrangement. You have your own operating system, I have my own operating system. But the condition for membership in the global system is that we must be open to each other and not overly try to interfere in each other's internal workings. Do you feel there is the political ability to do the right thing, to quote Tim Geithner? I think it would be difficult. It requires more coordination. Uh, we need the G20 because there's no other assembly which can do this. It will be messy. It's inevitably messy because we are entering a very messy global power arrangement. I think when there are emergencies like the present run on European banks, then emergency action is required. But in terms of larger rebalancing, we cannot hope to remove our own pain, the pain of readjustment, by transferring to a global system or transferring to somebody else. The danger in the hope of a global architecture is that somehow I can pass on my problem, my pain, to my neighbour or to an international organisation. And that in itself becomes a disincentive towards deep internal transformation, which in many countries is absolutely what's needed. To Jan Tiam, uh, again, I press the same point with you. Policy indecision and political dysfunction as we examine glo governing global growth, the new context. Um, look, for, for, for us, and we are um, a major investor in, in markets globally, uh, what we believe is that there is a, a crisis of confidence. I completely agree with Christine Lagarde on that. Um, if I look at each zone in turn, uh, Gordon, I wouldn't change a word to what you said. We, we've transformed the banking crisis into a fiscal uh, deficit, and I think that was the right answer. What we don't have uh, is the instruments to manage um, that fiscal, manage through that fiscal crisis without uh, destroying investors' confidence uh, in the system uh, for a variety of reasons, because I think Europe didn't change its paradigm as the world changed. It used to be that if you were a French bank, being in Poland was diversification. It was 30 years ago, 20 years ago. It's not anymore. I think Europe got caught into a concentration risk trap. It just didn't realize that its strategy was really putting all their eggs in the same basket. And I agree that they need to diversify their, 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 their trade and really look outwards and, and just change strategy and recognize that there is systemic risk in, in Europe. All the banks are too exposed to sovereign risk. There is no confidence in the value of a sovereign debt, and therefore the whole system is, is threatened with collapse. So we, we need to break out of that, and frankly, uh, the politicians uh, have not so far uh, given us investors enough confidence uh, that they can deal with those issues, leading to massive sell-off. Uh, even we as a company have done the same thing. We have reduced our exposure to the Eurozone and Euro financials systematically over the last two years, and that, that is not positive long-term, because you have to go back to the macro. We are an insurance company, we have liabilities, I promises to our customers, we need returns to deliver them. 
we are going to make all our customers poorer if 10, 15, 20 years down the road we cannot deliver the returns that we have promised. It is important to have growth because in the end uh, that is the only way we can meet uh, the liabilities we have. So we need to go back to a functioning of a system that allows growth to happen with sound uh, fiscal policies. The US, I think, is in a different situation because it is uh, a very dynamic economy, very innovative. There is always another Facebook, another Google around the corner. They are in a difficult political situation until the election. We all know that. I don't think Obama will get anything from the Republicans until then. But after that, whether it is Obama in a second mandate or a new president in a first mandate, you can expect more resolute action and you can expect them to, to deal with the issues brings me to my, my third and final comment, which is about the rest of the world. For me, and that's why I'm here actually, a, a big part of the answer is in China. Uh, I think that we will only come out of this um, um, by the top uh, if we have some form of soft landing that's delivered by China, which is largely a function of things that the Premier talked about here yesterday, developing domestic consumer demand and substituting that to the US consumer who drove growth over the year 2000s and cannot do it anymore because he's leveraged and needs to deleverage. Uh, same thing for other banks. So uh, if you go back to basics, earnings are good, the corporate sector is very healthy, the real economy is doing well, uh, we, we're all very profitable as companies. Uh, the general uh, balance of the Eurozone is healthy, debt to GDP is 80%. What we're dealing with here is policy risk and the risk of policy mistakes uh, faced with a banking crisis uh, and a sovereign crisis uh, in parallel in, in, the, in the Eurozone. You've had your own challenges uh, at, the, at the top of uh, Prudential, but let me put it to you. You are sitting on a platform with two uh, political leaders, mm. uh, and you said you don't have confidence. Um, uh, politicians have not given you confidence. Mm. What do you want from the political class uh, which is necessary to do the right thing? <laughs> A, 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 credible, a credible plan of action. I mean, Gordon was talking about a G20 meeting, some kind of meeting with some visibility and credible actions that will give us confidence that we can hold, uh, call them euro bonds if you want, but we can hold paper we believe in and um, that will do what it's supposed to do. Do you think the political class have the nerve to do what is necessary, given that all of them face election cycles? I think I'm going to defer to... to, to no, I'm uh, asking you. <laughs> you, are, you are entitled to a view. No, I know. Um, look, um, I don't think we have a choice. Gordon Brown. I think... You know, you, Ch Churchill, uh, Winston Churchill, described the situation in the 1930s uh, when you had the similar risk of protectionism at a time when you had recession. And he said that politicians had been resolved to be irresolute. They'd been adamant for drift. They'd been solid for fluidity. And they'd been all powerful for impotence. Uh, <laughs> and uh, you may want to repeat the words of uh, Shelley when he said that politicians had lost the art of communications, but not, alas, the gift of speech. Uh, it's easy, I think, to, to, to say that uh, it's a fact, of course, the political leadership is not. Uh, delivered a solution to this um, latest stage of the economic crisis. But it's, I think it's because leaders have been looking inwards and not outwards. I, I think you've got to recognize that this is a problem that is only susceptible to solution if there is global coordination. And, and let me just describe what I mean. We're at a unique juncture, as, as you were describing, in world economic history. For 150 years, Europe and America have outproduced and outconsumed and outmanufactured and outtraded the rest of the world. But in 1910, 2010, for the first time in 150 years, Europe and America were outproduced and outinvested and outmanufactured and outtraded by the rest of the world. And what has happened, as you rightly described, is that the global shift of economic power is such that the rest of the world, and China and Asia principally, are now responsible for the majority of production and investment in the world economy, but the Europe and America are responsible for the majority of consumption. It means that we are mutually dependent on each other. Ten years ago, America could drive the world economy as a consumer as well as a producer. Ten years from now, 20 years from now is certainly, Asia will be able to drive the whole of the world economy forward by its ability to produce, but also its high levels of consumption, which is the development of the Asian middle class which is happening now. But at the moment we're at this juncture where we're mutually dependent on each other. 
that Asia can produce, but it relies on European and American markets for export and consumption. And America uh, relies uh, on its ability to borrow from the rest of the world uh, to enable it to consume. That is the juncture that we are at, and you've got to have special policy measures to deal with that. Uh, and so you cannot have a recovery in Europe and America without some uh, agreement with, with Asia. Uh, America, like Britain, like uh, the rest of Europe, wants to export its way out of its problems. But it can't do that unilaterally. It's got to have some understanding with the rest of the world about uh, how trading relationships are going to develop. So I think the bargain is this, that China has got to be persuaded to increase its consumption, and Pres Premier Wen said yesterday that's what he wanted to do. India has got to open up its markets more uh, to uh, cut the prices for consumers and a whole series of basic goods where it could import. Uh, at the same time, uh, Asia has got to be more open to trade from the rest of, rest of the world. But America and Europe have got to reform and they've got to invest in infrastructure to equip themselves for the future. And the bargain is essentially this, that as uh, Asia increases its consumption faster, America has got the confidence, and so has Europe, that it can export to the rest of the world and you create a self-reinforcing cycle of growth that gives people confidence that China that is not going to lose its export markets, America that is going to be able to export to the rest of the world, and then you've got the basis of moving forward in a situation where American consumption cannot drive the world economy forward, but equally at the same time, uh, Asian production cannot drive the world economy forward on its own at the moment. Now that's what I mean by a global growth pact, uh, and that's what the G20 should be agreeing at the moment. Uh, and around that you can deal with the problems of exchange rates, inflation, you can deal with the problems also of trade agreements and protectionism, but you've got to have a vision of a world economy that is capable of generating a higher level of sustainable uh, growth. It's not that Asia is not growing, and it's not that China is not growing fast, it's that the basis for sustainable growth is not there at the moment at this unique juncture in history. And that's where we need political leadership, and that's why the G20 is crucial to the solution of this, and that's why, in my view, the G20 should be meeting uh, now to look at a global growth pact, uh, re-establishing confidence in the global financial system, special measures to support Europe so that it can actually start to grow again, as well as solve its uh, banking crisis, and hopefully getting a better framework for climate change so that we can get investment around the world in renewables uh, and get, uh, of course, trade moving forward in a way that we would like to see with less protectionism. Now, if we don't do that, we will slip back into a protectionist uh, world. Unemployment will remain high in Europe and America, and Asia will start to lose the momentum it has from being able to export uh, substantially to the rest of the world. That's the danger we face, and that's why political leadership is so important at the moment. I'm going to come to you to, uh, to come in with questions in a moment. Um, Giorgio, in your country, uh, you've just had an election where uh, your government um, took a bit of a hit because the public didn't have as much confidence as they traditionally have, even though your numbers are, are, are very solid and very positive. And just picking up what Gordon Brown has just said about governance and what the public expect, and given what President Obama is now about to enter with the re-election process over the next 14 months, how much is the public view now a considerable part of the, um, the judgment that has to be made in the political calculations of governing global growth and moving in the directions that we've heard from all three of you need to be done. Well, with the iPhone and the Blackberry in the pocket, the disintermediation of hierarchies is a relentless, inexorable process. Institutions are all coming under attack because the myths, the hypocrisies which protected them in the past are all being punctured by the access to information. So whether you're a Catholic church or whether you're a big government or big corporation, there's growing distrust. And Singapore is part of the same process that's going on around the world. From hierarchies to networks, from leadership appropriate to hierarchies to leadership styles more appropriate to networks. That's a shift that we are seeing. And those, those who are able to make that shift, I think will, will succeed. While those who are less able to will find themselves cast aside. But we are part of that same global phenomenon sweeping the world. 
but going back to Gordon's point about uh, restructuring and the importance of global coordination, global coordination can either help deep restructuring or make it more difficult. I think it's, it's crucial that global restructuring requires as a precondition deep internal restructuring. I'm spending a few months in Beijing University as a visiting scholar and I've been going around with the Singapore students there, visiting their dormitories and trying to understand life from a worm's eye view and comparing student life in China with student life when I was an undergraduate in England and as a postgraduate student in America. Material conditions are still quite backwards. Students are exceedingly hardworking. They are smart alive to the changes in the world and determined to compete and get on. Now think about it. With globalization, it's going to equalize around the world, which means that the worker in Greece, the worker in America, the worker in Wuhan, in Singapore, are all subject to the same set of market forces. There could be some friction, but only to a point. There's no escaping very painful restructuring in many parts of the world. And that this pain will cause great upheavals in domestic politics. My fear is the hope invested in global coordination is really to remove that pain and postpone it. But the longer we administer steroids, I think the worse that the worse the underlying problem becomes. That, that's my concern. But of course, without global coordination, internal restructuring will become even more difficult. And we need growth. Tijan, when, from your position, when you talk, unless you want to pick up on that point, but no, no, when you talk no, no. about confidence in politicians yeah. or confidence in politicians yeah. to do the right thing, yeah. when you've just heard that very frank assessment of the, the new upward pressure. Yeah, I, I agree with that. Uh, I'd like to say, you know, it's a famous quote, they, they, they only do the right thing once they've exhausted all the other options. But, you know, that, that's what we've been faced with. That and used to be said about the Americans. Yeah, that's <laughs> but the, 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 we, the market, have had to come in and, and be quite tough almost acting like a, a, a schoolmaster. Every time people come up with something that's unrealistic, you know, their bonds have been hit or their spreads have gone out because we're saying, look, this is not serious. And I think we need to, to move to a more adult uh, mode of operation where politicians actually uh, stop the demagoguery. To, to be as blunt as George, I think that the initial statements made in Germany about, about the Greeks were not helpful. I think they've limited the policy options in terms of being able to deal with the Greek situation today. And I think we need to move to a more responsible discourse because the, the expectations from the younger generations and the transparency in information, whether it's from twittering or other things, is now almost infinite and instantaneous. And, do you think that's handicapping the ability of the political leaders to do what you want, to no, create I think, confidence? I think they just haven't quite taken the measure of how powerful that is. And they are still operating in a world of as, as George said, hypocrisy and half-truths where they could get away with that. Well, that world is gone, and they need to address to a new, much more transparent world where the sanction is immediate. I think a number of times they've been surprised by the market reaction. You know, they've said things, they've been punished immediately, and within a few hours, they ended up doing the right thing or saying the right thing, after having attempted not to. Let, before I go to the, the audience, I mean, Gordon Brown, you sat in G20 meetings and many other meetings uh, while you were, were Prime Minister. That, that um, description there of hypocrisy and lack of, lack of nerve, if you like, to do the right thing, given the enormity of what is now facing, uh, facing us all. Yeah, I, I think the assumption of your questions, uh, Nick, is that there is somehow a solution waiting there to be applied and the politicians don't have the will to apply it. Uh, I, I think the, the more correct assessment of the situation is uh, that we've got to understand what needs to be done and agree on that uh, and there is not yet uh, an agreement on what needs to be done. I'm putting forward a set of proposals but I accept that I don't have uh, 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 consent to run the world for the things that I'm proposing but we've got to agree on what needs to be done first and then I believe you could find the political will to do it. And I think part of this discussion should be about what needs to be done. You see, in 2009, we had a banking crisis.
that was the result of a financial market breakdown uh, and we tried to solve it in a number of different ways. In 2011, it has morphed into what is a political uh, sovereign debt crisis uh, where the argument is that what is needed uh, is uh, fiscal uh, uh, contraction and of course that is right but we haven't yet solved the 2009 problem so we've still got a banking problem in Europe uh, we've still got a financial sector problem and it's actually being acted out in the interplay between the liabilities that uh, countries now have for the banking debts uh, as well as for the fiscal, fiscal position and unless we recognize that in Europe will not be able to solve the problem. So you can have hundreds of meetings, but unless people are prepared to face up to what the problem is they've got to deal with, you will not get the right answer. Uh, and I somehow suspect that there is not yet a consensus in Europe about what needs to be done. And because there is not a consensus, I probably would tend to the conclusion that you will need an international uh, agreement, uh, not simply a Euro area agreement, uh, to sort out some of the problems that Europe now faces and the IMF will be involved at some stage in this in my view. Mm. Uh, just to build on that, I really think that the, the problem is that what needs to be done fiscally is not politically feasible and that's why you have to revert to some form of international solution. Uh, it exposes a design flaw in the Euro. The Euro assumes that out of the policy mix you give up interest rates, you give up currency, and you only have one instrument, which is fiscal policy. Yep. In politics, that is the bluntest instrument, because that means in cutting state expenditure at the trough of a cycle, and state expenditure is salary. In every country, 67% is salary, it's people, firing thousands of people at the bottom of a cycle, and raising taxes. So it is not uh, a credible and realistic instrument at the trough. So you need more, you need demand, and that brings me back to my argument about China, and the importance of China starting to consume so that you can bridge because fiscal adjustments take place over time. You cannot, you know, if anybody who's done a budget, a national budget, you cannot do them from one year to another. You have to do them over a period, a multi-year period. And in the meantime, China can come in and provide a bridge for the world economy to get in the right place. Giorgio and uh, Gordon Brown, just picking up on that point, what has to be done fiscally cannot be done politically. Giorgio, uh, I, I, I just I'm, go I'm not sure that, sorry, Giorgio. George. Uh, following on Tihani's point about China, China will do what is in China's enlightened self-interest. China is not going to consume to save the world uh, because the Chinese government is ultimately responsible to its own people. Uh, so I think that's a key to create an international structure where each country will act in its own enlightened self-interest by cooperating. I think it's just by pressure, by counter threats, it's not going to lead to a, to a happier outcome. But, Gordon Brown. Yeah. Yeah. Georgia, what I'm actually saying is it is in China's self-interest to increase its consumption faster and in Asia's interest for those countries that are dependent on exports to also show that they're willing to import uh, because it will become self-defeating uh, to pursue an export-only strategy in a world where America and Europe cannot consume as much as they did. Uh, and, and therefore, um, uh, Asia has got to be ready to import as well as export for us to be in a position to have self-reinforcing growth around the world. So it is in China's self-interest to increase its consumption so that it can be open, as Premier Wen said yesterday, to more imports, but at the same time, it will be able to continue its exports if there is an American market and a European market that is able to consume. So uh, there is mutual self-interest in the proposals I'm putting forward. Uh, the, the, the issue in Europe, uh, as, as I think we're starting to, to, to agree, is, is, is financial in terms of its banking system, is its failure to be able to generate growth, which means that uh, it's uh, uh, got uh, deficits that are rising partly because there is no tax revenues and there is high unemployment, and it's a fiscal problem. If you don't recognize it's three problems in one, you'll get to the wrong solutions. And my worry is that the, uh, by labeling it simply a fiscal problem, uh, then you can impose all the fiscal contraction in the world and you can create all the austerity and if it doesn't work, create more austerity, but you can drive the economy further into recession. And so you see in Greece that they're now expecting 5% uh, uh, negative growth this year 
uh, and we're not seeing growth recover in Spain or in Portugal or in Italy and Ireland in the way that we expected. Unless you recognize you've got to stimulate growth, you've got to deal with the banking problem as well as deal with the fiscal problem, then there is no easy way out uh, uh, for, for, for Europe and you will be locked into uh, low growth for 10 years. Jam. You've got to recognize yeah. it's a triple problem. Yeah, no, I, I completely agree with that. We've created very significant deficits in terms of percentage of GDP. They can only be uh, solved over a long period of time and we need growth. We need growth to solve them and I think that the governments need to stop worrying about inflation. From my perspective as an investor, the biggest risk to the world economy is deflation, not inflation today. And that's what we need to avoid at all costs. Right, let's hear, please, who's, uh, plenty of questions. Um, to the back and uh, here as well. You've got a microphone, please, at the front here. Who's got the microphone there? Further back there. Wait a minute. No, there. There. <laughs> You've got the microphone. <laughs> Yes, thank you. Uh, I'm Brian So from Hong Kong PCCW. I would like to address a question to Mr. Gordon Brown. As we observed that as yesterday night, the ECB and other central banks have joined together again to uh, push some liquidity uh, emergency operation again. But actually, three years before 2008, in September also, the central bank do the same things. Do you think uh, after three years, do this action again and again, the effectiveness is diminishing or is this the good way, good direction to direct the crisis we are facing now? Thank you. Well, well they're dealing with a different situation, sorry. Keep going. Yeah. Uh, in 2008 and 2009, uh, they were in intervening because of the problems of the banks. Uh, in 2011, they're now intervening because there are problems not only of banks but of, uh, of, of governments. Uh, and this is what complicates the, the problem as you move forward. I've got no doubt that the European Central Bank is uh, central uh, to how we uh, solve the problem in the short term. Uh, but you will have to have a political agreement about who takes responsibility uh, for either bailing out the banks uh, or for uh, uh, restoring growth in the European economy. Uh, and that will require a political, a, a set of political decisions. So the ECB is now dealing with a different problem from the one it had in 2008 and 2009, but it's actually a more serious problem uh, because in 2008, governments could intervene to sort out the problems of banks. And now in 2011, banks have problems, but so too have governments. Uh, and that's why we need a, a better way out of this. Uh, and I would uh, myself say that uh, even now, uh, a European stability fund uh, that was working, in other words, set up and working, able to deliver money, uh, the 400 billion, is not enough. That will not solve the problem. Uh, you will need a far more coordinated response that will involve the underpinning of the European economy by substantially more resources, and perhaps you will need uh, IMF and international support to do that. And so I do take uh, seriously the proposal that is made by Premier Wen. Uh, that uh, China uh, would be in a position to do more uh, to help uh, regenerating growth in the world economy. It's, it's really back to this. You've got to deal with the banking problem. You've got to deal with the problem of restoring growth in the European economy as well as deal with the long-term problem of fiscal consolidation. Tijan? Uh, look, I, uh, I, uh, I, find, I find it difficult to disagree with you. So, I, I have so you agree? To, very, little to, very little to, to add. It's, um, it's, it's the right way. Uh, we have to keep saying that it's a, it's a global problem. Uh, coordination, and I agree with George, is not a cure all. Uh, it's not sufficient, but it's necessary. Without coordination, we don't have a fighting chance. Thanks. Please. Yes, sir. Yeah, Alessandro Magnoli Bocchi from Kui China Investment Company. Uh, thank you very much uh, for the comprehensive analysis of what should happen. Moving now from the normative analysis to the positive analysis, to what will happen. I was trying to get the takeaway message, not only from this session, but also from the forum. And uh, my takeaway is that uh, the situation is urgent, but it will take time. <laughs> so, and I agree with the assessment, right? Mm. Uh, but that means muddle through, stagnation, suffering, n possibly not disorderly adjustments. Do you agree? Thank you. Do you agree? would like to answer the question. Give, look at the positive side of this. George. Well, <laughs> George Schumpeter. You've left, you've left them speechless. Creative destruction. I mean, we all like the creative bit. No one likes the destruction bit. 
but without some destruction, there can be no new creation. And part of the pain, part of the contraction, uh, enables future growth to take place. Because in the end, we cannot avoid massive repricing of factors of production worldwide yeah. because of competition. Yeah. If you compare what an engineer worked, earns, the hours he works in China, mm. and the one in India, IIT graduate, with the one in, in Europe or America, that equalization requires a lot of destruction first. And it's going to lead to, within each country, a stretching out of income levels because the owners of land and capital, they are going to benefit a lot from globalization. But those who are providing intellectual and manual labor, they will face very stiff competition. So unless a social system within each country allows for a sensitive reallocation so that society is kept soft and sweet, I think there will be a lot of problems. But this pain, this restructuring is a necessary part of the solution. I, I, I think there's a danger of too much pessimism though, uh, because I, I believe this is a soluble problem and not an insoluble problem. Uh, I believe that the central argument that Georgia is uh, putting has got to be answered though. Uh, I think there's a general agreement that if you could have coordination, you could return to a stronger growth path that, that is more sustainable than the one we've had for the last two years since the, since the world uh, uh, recession. Uh, but his argument, and it's got to be taken seriously, is that if coordination was at the expense of the restructuring that is necessary, then it would be merely postponing the problem instead of solving the problem. M my proposals for a global growth pact require very substantial restructuring and structural reform, you might say, in Europe uh, and in, in America. Uh, and I believe the only way that uh, America and Europe can equip themselves uh, to compete uh, for, for, for the future is improving their education system, improving uh, the uh, capital uh, markets, the financial uh, markets in a way that uh, was not done before the recession, uh, and of course improving their infrastructure. And we've got to find a basis on which that, that can be done in Europe and America. You need fiscal consolidation and restructuring, but you also need infrastructure investment to equip yourself for the future. And that suggests that you need a time uh, base, you need a, a time frame uh, for the restructuring of debt and the deficit to enable you to begin to growth, uh, begin to return to growth in, in parts of Europe and America uh, in a way that is sustainable and at the same time get the investment that's needed for, for, the, for the future. So I, I don't uh, disagree you, with you that you must have the restructuring internally to allow yourself to be in a position to compete in this new global economy, but I don't think that should rule out coordination which is a necessary means by which you get back to growth while at the same time you're undertaking the restructuring that every country is going to have to uh, be, be involved in. And I would emphasize the urgency, as, as, as you were suggesting. Uh, politicians, I think, uh, uh, are forced by crises uh, to act, and uh, we would not have had the action in 2009 at the G20 had people not sensed that the markets were uh, collapsing around us uh, and we had to act. Now I think people are starting to realize probably a lot later than they should have about the urgency of the situation in the euro but I think also realizing that the world economy is starting to uh, experience uh, lower growth than we expected as a whole. So acting with a global coordination plan now is where we need to be. Yeah, I'm also reasonably optimistic. So I think in every crisis um, it's important to have a right diagnostic, not like in 1929, 1930, and I think we are converging through these conversations on what's going on. We are converging on, on some of the solutions. Uh, the Chinese Premier made some very important statements when he said that China would play its role, but I think his words were that everybody has to get their house in order, and I completely agree with George that the, the dealing with the deficit is key, but I also believe that politically that is not feasible unless you have some growth. So, and that's what all the governments that just go into a state of authority without growth realize relatively quickly after two or three years, so we need but growth. Picking up Gordon yeah. Brown's point, do you, do you think that political leaderships at the moment understand just how profound and deep this crisis really is now? I think, I think as of today they do. As of two or three weeks ago maybe Belatedly. I think, I think belatedly, yeah, I think okay. they do. It's a fundamental problem we have to address. I don't believe that national Introduce leadership... Introduce yourself, Arthur Mutambara. Arthur Mutambara, Zimbabwe. I do not believe that national leadership can provide global governance. 
politicians with national mandates who pursue national interests. The people who elect them are not always clear that the national interest is aligned to the global interest. Secondly, and more importantly, business, which is incentivized by profits, cannot provide global leadership. Business must be incentivized by the impact on the environment and impact on society. If those two things are not done to address the issue and the inadequacy of national leadership and also how we define success for business. Thank you. Uh, move the microphone forward, please, Arthur. <clears throat> Alex Clark, University of Alberta, formerly of Scotland. Um, often in life, we can't control the things that are really important. Uh, and this issue of solvability is key. We're dealing with a US political system that appears to be broken and bipartisan and engaged in brinkmanship that could have global implications. What specific messages do we give to domestic politicians in the US in relation to giving swift, effective, and decisive leadership? So pick up on Arthur Mutambara's points as well. Gordon Brown. Well, I, th I think both the questions are about thinking globally, really. Uh, if America Look, America is faced with this, uh, this, this specific set of problems. It cannot consume a, a huge amount in addition to what it's been consuming uh, because it's uh, high levels of borrowing. Its public deficits uh, are substantial and therefore it's got to cut them, uh, not increase them. Public investment therefore cannot rise substantially, indeed it might fall. Uh, America is therefore locked into this uh, position where it's relying on exports to the rest of the world to become its main driver of growth. And it cannot do that without there being a world that is ready to take its exports and is therefore a world economy that's growing. So America cannot solve its problem simply by looking in on itself. It's got to look to cooperation with the rest of the world. Europe's in exactly the same problem. Uh, but it cannot either devalue its currencies uh, because the individual countries are now part of the euro area and have removed that flexibility which is available to Britain, available to America and available to most other countries. And it has decided that it will not uh, tolerate any defaults uh, and therefore it's got to bail out or do something to support those countries that are in difficulty. So both these continents are constrained uh, in their ability to act uh, by decisions that they've, they've made but cannot in themselves solve the problem that they've, they've got. They rely on us having some cooperative uh, arrangement around the world to deal with these problems. Now, is the world ready uh, to be able to come to these agreements? We failed to get a trade agreement, WTO failed. We failed to get a climate change agreement, Copenhagen failed. Uh, we failed to get agreement on global financial standards because we've retreated from the idea in 2009 we'd have global standards to having simply national or, or regional agreements about what the financial standards are. And we will pay, in my view, a very heavy price for that when the next financial crisis uh, is, is, is threatening us. Uh, and we've, of course, we failed to get the Global Growth Pact that was promised in 2000, 2009. Can, uh, to answer the first question, uh, the world rise above these national uh, uh, protectionist sentiments uh, and accept it needs to act globally? And can America, in particular, understand that its uh, problems cannot be solved by a more protectionist response within America, but relies on it seeing that it's a vital part of the global economy and depends on the global economy. I, I think you can persuade people that it is in the national self-interest to act uh, in an internationalist way. And I think that's really the challenge that, the second, uh, that this G20 faces in November. We managed to persuade people to do that in 2009 because there was a huge crisis. And now in 2011, there's another kind of crisis I think we can persuade people to do it. But to be honest, it does depend on people going back from here to their own countries and saying there is no national only solution to many of the problems we now face in the world. You can't have financial stability without all countries participating in financial arrangements. You can't have growth uh, to the level we want without an ability to cooperate with each other. We saw Premier Wen making a, an approach uh, and uh, a suggestion yesterday uh, I think now the rest of the world should follow that up and say, look, let's get back to the Global Growth Pact idea and let's see if we can coordinate our policies. And that will depend on America having a plan, not just for America, but America having suggestions about how 
it has a plan for the rest of the world, a sort of Marshall Plan type idea uh, coming out of America would be something that would be incredibly powerful as a result of the proposals made by Premier Wen and others. Giorgio, do you fear that with the 14 months of political um, electioneering in the United States and, and America now focused on home, as the President puts it, that this in its own way is going to handicap the chances of creating the good governance for global growth, which all of you are asking for? I think all governments are responsible first and foremost to their own people. Um, that, that is an inescapable reality. It is each in its own enlightened self-interest to cooperate on issues of common concern like the financial system, climate change, pandemics, ter terrorism and so on, but only up to a point. And if there's conflict between your domestic considerations and your international responsibilities, then well, through peer pressure, through a variety of means, we should try to find a good optimum. But the world is going to muddle along, as it has for much of its history. I mean, the, for, for how long in history have we been globally coordinated? And that did not stop the rise and fall of empires and great economies. China and India are going to grow whatever happens to the global system and three billion people joining the global middle classes, I mean, that can be a bad thing for the world. But of course, we are more interconnected as never before, and where we can coordinate, we must coordinate. And there's got to be a growing sense of common humanity, of all of, of, all of us belonging to the same community. That will take time. It requires education. It requires goodwill. It requires leadership. But I think that will come. Uh, so I... I'm all in favour of what uh, Gordon has proposed in terms of greater global coordination, provided that it reinforces the necessary internal restructuring without which the system cannot be stable. But can I just press you? You talked about muddling on. Could the muddling on go on for even longer because of the American political process over the next 14, 15 months? Um, politicians react best when there's a crisis and, and leadership is most exercised. They want to get re-elected as well. They want to get re-elected as well. Gordon Brown. It, it, well, it is a problem. <laughs> Gordon Brown, uh, the issue of muddling on, do you fear, I mean, you're, you've written about, you, and you, you have so much experience of the US political system, but do you fear that what is now going to happen uh, and the complexities of American politics and the inevitabilities of what's happening will slow down the process to produce that uh, unity you're looking for? Well, I think, I think the problem is America it, it will tend to look in on itself rather than understand that the solution to its problem lies uh, with uh, coordination with the rest of the world. Do you so, fear that? Well, the American political system will, will push people into more protectionist positions uh, unless people decide that they've got to find another way of solving that problem. Look, I can't say I'm a great advert uh, for putting forward international solutions and persuading uh, national electorates because uh, at the last election in Britain, I was very clear that um, uh, if we didn't take the measures that we were taking, then growth would falter, unemployment would rise, uh, our deficits would not be solved because we would have problems of uh, low growth leading to less tax revenues and leading to um, higher unemployment. And, and we're seeing exactly that happening, but people preferred to take what I think was a more uh, parochial view of the world and said, look, um, uh, the debt in Britain is the bigger problem. Uh, and growth uh, can wait uh, for a solution to the debt problem. Now, I think I'm being proved right, obviously, but equally at the same time, uh, I've got to show you, if I'm proposing a, a global uh, growth pact, that we can go beyond these uh, protectionist answers to, 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 to individual countries' problems. And I think it requires people to have a sense of the urgency of the problem, which is coming, uh, which probably wasn't there a year from now, a year, a year ago, uh, but also a sense of what can be achieved. And to be honest, a year ago, Premier Wen did not say uh, that China wanted to be part of an international solution uh, to the problems of uh, European and American uh, low growth. Uh, and at that time, we did not have the pressure uh, in the same way that we now have from different parts of the world for political leaders uh, to respond. So I'm more optimistic than I was a year ago that uh, political leaders can come together 
but at that time, uh, of course, uh, we, 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 now we've got to be more pessimistic about the world economy right. because we're moving into a, a downturn that we did not anticipate when we came out of the I want to get one recession. more question in, if you don't mind. Uh, are you in agreement here? here no, to I was just saying that for me what Premier Wen said is the most important thing that, that happened this week is new and comes from a very sound analysis of China's need for a healthy European and US economy and a willingness to help them. And do you fear the impact of the American political process uh, on, on this process? Yeah, yes, I do, but democracy has a cost, and I think that's a cost of having okay. a democracy. One more question, please. You've got the microphone. Uh, Claudio Trevisan from the Brazilian newspaper Estado de São Paulo. Is the Greece default avoidable, or the faster it comes, the better? Well, I mean, I'm... Uh, I, I can see the way things are going to work themselves out over the next few months, so uh, it, it's not a question of... Which is you, which way? Well, it's not a question of whether you predict, it's a question of, of what you see now happening around you. People do not believe at the moment that Greek can uh, come through without a default. That's, that's the position that the markets are, are, now, are now taking. People fear a bank run in, in Greece and, and, and elsewhere. Uh, instead of being alarmist about it and trying to make uh, predictions, uh, I would prefer to say, look, here are the things that now need to be done uh, to avoid some of these uh, scenarios becoming the, 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 the if you like, the, uh, the dominant set of events uh, round, round Europe. And I would say that you've got to get a grip of the banking problem, and I would say you've got to find a, a policy that returns you to growth, uh, and then you've got to be in a position to deal with the, the deficits, which as uh, has been said in this table, over across Europe, uh, deficits are about 5% of GDP, and debt is about 80% of uh, GDP. Uh, deficits are half those of America and Japan. Uh, you've got to be able to find a way of sorting that uh, prob 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 Japan. problem out, recognizing that that is the, uh, the central set of problems that Europe faces. Yeah. You need a banking should, answer, should. you need a growth answer, and you need to deal with the fiscal problems over time. Tijan, should Greece be allowed to default? Or should we expect it now to default? I don't think they will. I don't think they will default. I think the market thinks they will default. I don't think they will because the consequences on the banks in particular uh, are too significant, particularly in France and in Germany, and I think they, they won't default. But if I can just throw in another thing that really worries me and that I take from my business. We've done a study of uh, pensions and aging and demography, and if you look at fiscal sustainability, all other things being equal, if the European countries uh, don't do anything, their budget deficits are going to go from 5% today to about 18% by 2030, 2040, just mechanistically under the weight of a changing demography. So that's one more reason to say that the deficit issue is absolutely vital and must be tackled, and debt to GDP will go to 250%. Thanks for that cheering us up, Tijan. By the way, Nick, that, that all depends on your assumptions about growth. Oh, growth, not growth. Uh, and, and, and growth. The assumption <coughs> is that Europe's trend growth rate is now less than 2%. But, but we've got structural uh, reform. Yeah, 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 that uh, absolutely. And, and, and the question is whether you're going to base all your assumptions about the future <laughs> on assuming that Europe is incapable of uh, re returning to a higher level of sustainable growth. You've got to create the structural reforms that make George. that growth happen. Exactly. Let, let me offer this view. It may sound a little provocative, but if Greece were to leave the Eurozone, then it's more likely that the Eurozone can be saved and the restructuring for everybody will be less painful and it will have an illuminating effect on domestic politics throughout Europe. At that point, I'm going to have to pause, I'm afraid, and ask you um, for your patience that it's, it's time to wrap it up. Uh, on that provocative note, George, thank you very much. I'm sorry we can't debate it any further, but thank you very much. You've had a very clear message of how global growth can be governed.